Hello and welcome to the second part of the Advanced Synthetic Aperture Radar webinar series for land cover applications. This is Erica Podest and I'd like to introduce to you our guest speaker for today's webinar, Dr. Heather McNairn from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. And she will be covering uh, the use of SAR to monitor agriculture. So she and her team will be doing um, some theory on SAR for agriculture applications, and then they will focus on a demo. And this webinar builds on what was presented on the advanced webinar from last year. So it's um, advanced skills building on what was um, covered back then. The material, the presentation material, and the recordings will be online in a couple of days. And now I'll pass this on to Dr. Heather McNairn. Uh, I'm very glad that she's with us once again. So thank you very much, Dr. McNairn. Uh, thank you, Erica, for that introduction. Uh, so um, I'm Heather McNairn. I'm a research scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. And I am going to be talking a little bit about the theory behind uh, exploiting synthetic aperture radar to monitor um, to monitor agriculture. And then I'm going to be passing it off to uh, Jin Feng, Sarah, and Amir, and they will be leading you through um, how to take radar data and process it um, for crop classification and soil moisture retrieval. Uh, so at the end of this webinar, uh, you will be able to understand how uh, SAR configurations affect responses from agricultural targets. Uh, you will understand the information content in SAR images, uh, which are relevant to both crop and soil conditions. What are those optimal sensor parameters that you want to choose to maximize your success in using radar for agriculture? And then finally, um, how to ingest pre-process and process SAR data for both crop classification and soil moisture retrieval. So we moved on to the next slide. Uh, whether we're planning um, how to acquire our radar data, or once we have the radar data, how do we interpret the SAR responses, we have to always keep in mind these three fundamental SAR system characteristics. And you've been introduced that to these before. Uh, that would be the SAR frequency or wavelength of the sensor, the polarizations at which those sensors are transmitting and receiving energy, as well as the geometry, both the incidence angle and the look direction of the SAR sensor. So interpreting radar responses are always done relative to these three SAR sensor characteristics. So let's start talking about frequency or wavelength. So of course, we want to select the best frequency possible to maximize success. So some of the things we're going to think about uh, when we're looking at a target, especially for agriculture, is we want to consider the size of the target elements relative to that radar frequency. So if we think about a crop canopy, that could be what is the total size of that crop canopy, as well as what are the, what are the sizes of the elements, the leaves and the stalks in that canopy, but relative to the radar frequency. Um, so to maximize the scattering, we want to select wavelengths that are comparable in size or smaller than these elements. Uh, we also have to ask ourselves, is it important to penetrate into the canopy or is our goal to maximize surface scattering? So again, think about a crop canopy. Do we want to uh, maximize the scattering from within the canopy itself or, is our, or are we trying to penetrate through the canopy so that we can provide information about the soil that's underneath that canopy. So of course, lower frequencies or longer wavelengths are going to provide better penetration into any target. And then we want to ask ourselves, is the goal to maximize or minimize the sensitivity to surface roughness? So for example, if our goal is to monitor whether farmers are tilling their fields, we want to maximize the sensitivity to surface roughness. But if our goal is to estimate soil moisture, we want to pick uh, wavelengths that are going to minimize the sensitivity to roughness. A lower frequency wave uh, will see our surface as smooth, while a high frequency wave will see the same surface as rough. 
So the question being, what is the best frequency for agriculture monitoring? Well, there's no simple answer because it really depends on what the purpose of the application is. So if we're thinking about soil moisture retrieval, for example, we tend to favor longer wavelengths. So wavelengths, for example, at L-band, um, and that's because those L-band wavelengths can penetrate through um, at least smaller canopies and interact with the underlying soil. And L-band also has a better penetration capability into the soil itself. If we're considering crop classification, or biophysical modeling of a crop canopy, it really depends on the canopy itself. So we wanna have enough penetration into the canopy, but not too much, because if we have too much penetration, again, we have a response coming from the soil as well. So for higher biomass crops or canopies, and you can think of corn or maybe sugarcane as being a high biomass crop, we would favor longer wavelengths because we do want some penetration into the canopy. But if we're thinking about lower biomass crops like soybeans or wheat, rice, those are good examples, we don't want too much penetration so that, um, again, we have interference from the underlying soil in that, that radar response. So what I'm showing here on this next slide is really the best of all worlds, and that is to integrate data from multiple frequencies. So this is a beautiful radar image that was acquired using C-band from RadarSet2, L-band from the ALO sensor, and X-band from TerraSAR-X. And this is a test site we have over Canada. And what you see from this multi-frequency multi image is that we are able to easily identify these four crop types, so canola, soybeans, corn, and wheat. And the reason that we have such a, uh, an easy time of, of being able to detect these different crop types is because we are really using the best of all of these different frequencies and we're able to best match the frequency uh, to the right canopy. So that really is your best option is integrating these different frequencies together. Let's move on now and talk about the radar incidence angle. So recall on the, the left, if we look at this, this image, um, the incidence angle is that angle between where the radar beam hits the Earth's surface and a normal or perpendicular to that incident beam. So the radar incidence angle determines a few things. First of all, the contribution of different target elements to backscatter. So shallower incidence angles interact more with the vegetation canopy, um, but if we have a radar image that is being collected at a much steeper incidence angle, we can expect that more of the signal will pass through that canopy and interact with the uh, lower parts of the canopy or the soil itself. The incidence angle also determines how rough a target appears to the radar. So surfaces appear smoother at larger incidence angles, um, and the most significant incidence angle effects are observed on those smoother surfaces. So let's take a, a look at what this means. Um, so backscatter will decrease with increasing incidence angle, and the rate and function of that decrease is target dependent. Uh, if we look at the graph at the bottom here, we are plotting um, increasing backscatter intensity on the y-axis, and the radar incidence angle on the x-axis. So these are uh, this is the radar response of three different soil um, surfaces. So the solid line shows a very smooth surface, and the dotted lines are surfaces that are rougher. And what we see is that, indeed, the backscatter decreases as the incidence angle increases but that that rate is quite different depending on how rough the soil surface is. And if we look at the picture on the right, for example, um, this no-till part, this part of the field that hasn't been tilled, would be more representative of this solid um, curve where we have a very significant drop in backscatter as angle increases, but where this tractor has tilled the field, um, the rate of change in backscatter um, with incidence angle uh, would have a, uh, a different function to it. Uh, so what this means is that uh, when a radar is viewing the same target at a different incidence angle, the backscatter will be different. 
And that means that sometimes we have to be very care careful about the selection of our incidence angles. So for example, if we want to use a temporal sequence of radar images for change detection, we don't want to mix incidence angles. Um, and that is because uh, that change over time may be um, simply a fact of a difference in incidence angle and not because the target is changing. So in this example, if we were interested in uh, monitoring when this farmer is tilling his field, uh, we want to make sure that the sequence of radar images we're collecting over time are being collected in the exact same uh, incidence angle so that those changes over time are related to tillage and not incidence angle. If we have models, either soil models or crop models that have incidence angle as a parameter in the map model, then it would be okay to um, mix different incidence angles in our modeling. Let's move on now and talk about uh, the last parameter, um, which is the SAR polarization. Uh, so the radar polarization determines how the transmitted microwave interacts with the target. Um, so if the target, such as vegetation, has a very dominant vertical structure, and often in agriculture that's the case, if we transmit a vert vertically polarized wave, uh, that wave will align with the vertical structure in our canopy and create a greater degree of scattering. Um, contrary to that, if our radar transmits a horizontally polarized wave, less of that energy is going to interact with the vertical structure of that target and more of that wave will make its way through the canopy and interact with the underlying soil. Um, and when we're considering transmit and receive signals, um, the amount of energy that is repolarized um, is often dependent upon the structure of the target, in, in this case, particularly the structure of the crop canopy. So repolarization simply means we are transmitting a horizontally polarized wave and because of interaction within the, tar within the target, we are uh, receiving uh, that amount of energy that has been repolarized into a vertically uh, polarized wave. Um, so what is the best polarization for agricultural monitoring? Um, this one is a bit, um, a bit easier because we know from the research that the cross polarization, each, either HV or VH, is the single best polarization, whether that is to identify what crops are being grown or what the biophysical condition of the crop is. And the second best polarization is usually the vertical-vertical polarization. And again, that's because we have that nice alignment of the vertically transmitted wave with that vertical crop structure. So now that we've talked about the SAR system characteristics, we covered the polarization, the frequency, and the incidence angle. I want to move now and talk about the target. So let's talk about what are the important target characteristics uh, when we're thinking about SAR response. And those two fundamental characteristics of the target that are most important um, are the structure or the roughness, depending if we're talking about a crop canopy or a soil as well as how much water is in the target. So let's talk first about soils. So with soils, we, we refer more to the surface roughness, and that is characterized by two parameters, the root mean square variance, which is the random roughness associated with, um, with the soil surface, as well as the surface correlation length. And on this slide, I've defined um, what both of those parameters mean. And if we look on the pictures on the right side of the screen, uh, in our top image, we have a very smooth soil surface. And with this soil surface, we have a very small random roughness and a very large correlation length. And the picture underneath that is a picture of a farmer's field that is being either chiseled or moldboard plowed. And here we have a much larger random roughness and a much smaller correlation length. So for soils, that random roughness is usually caused by tillage, um, as we have in these, these photographs on this slide, or it could be from other farming operations, such as seeding or harvesting. And that roughness can be modified over time by the effects of both soil erosion and weathering. And in, in addition to this random roughness, these types of farming operations can also cause periodic row structures either due to tillage or planting, and those periodic row structures also affect the radar response. 
Uh, so what does that mean in terms of the effect of roughness on backscatter? Well, backscatter will increase as soil roughness increases and rougher soils will be will appear brighter on the radar image. And here on this slide, I'm just showing um, on the right-hand side some photos of different types of agricultural fields and different roughness ranges. So in the top of the slide, you see an untilled field. Um, so for this untilled field, when the, radar, the incident radar wave hits this untilled field, there is a little bit of scattering back to the radar sensor, but most of that scattering is in the forward direction. And because of that, the response in the radar image of a field uh, in this condition, uh, that backscatter would be quite low. And if I look at the other end of the, um, the other extreme on the bottom right, I have a moldboard plowed field. This has a lot of roughness. And again, when the incident wave hits that, that soil surface, um, because of that structure, that roughness, more of that incident wave energy will scatter back to the radar sensor um, and we will have a brighter radar return. The impact of roughness on backscatter depends on the frequency and the incidence angle. So recall um, I was saying that we always have to keep the radar SAR parameters in mind. So roughness is really a relative concept in radar responses. And that concept is uh, documented through the Rayleigh criterion and this, um, this equation. So a soil is considered smooth if its roughness, that RMS roughness, here denoted by H, is less than this function. And note that that is um, directly related to the radar wavelengths and indirectly related to the radar incidence angle. So we move on to the next slide. We're going to talk a little bit more specifically what that means. So what I've done here is I've taken that Rayleigh criterion and I've made some calculations uh, for some um, common radar sensors. So we have an X-band sensor, Terrasar X, a C-band sensor, Radar Sat 2, and an L-band sensor, Pulsar. And I've done these Rayleigh criterion calculations using both a 30 degree and a 50 degree incidence angle. So what does this tell, tell us? If I was using Terrasar X as my, um, my sensor uh, acquiring uh, the data, um, if my field had a random roughness H of less than 0.45 centimeters, then Terrasar X would see that particular field as being smooth. But all other fields on that image that have a random roughness greater than 0.45 centimeters, Terrasar X would see all of those fields as being rough. And if I look at the other extreme, so now I'm going to go down to the bottom and look at the pulsar sensor. So an L-band sensor, a longer wavelength, and a 50 degree incidence angle. Um, now any of my fields uh, in the pulsar image that have a random roughness less than 4.59 centimeters, pulsar will see those as smooth, and all of the other fields in that image, that L-band sensor will see as rough. And if I look on the right-hand side, this is a chart, a chart showing different tillage operations. So we have um, moldboard plows, some chisel plows, and at the bottom, uh, no-till fields. And on the right of this chart, we have that random roughness, that RMS roughness in centimeters. So you see that moldboard plows have a, um, a high degree of random roughness, and of course, no-till have a lower degree of roughness. And then in red, what I have identified is all of those fields that that sensor would view as being rough. And in red, all of those um, tillage operations that those sensors would see as smooth. And what you see from here is that tar Terrasar X at X band is going to see almost all of those tillage operations as being rough and only the no-till operations as being smooth. And at the other end, the Pulsar L band, um, that sensor is going to see most of those uh, tillage operations as being smooth and only the very roughest um, tillage operation, the moldboard plowing as being um, as being rough. So quite simply, if I was interested in looking at soil moisture, for example, I would likely favor the L-band pulsar because 
um, it will see most of those uh, tilled agricultural fields as smooth and thus minimizing the effect of surface roughness. Uh, so now that we've talked about uh, surface roughness related to soils, let's talk about the vegetation effects. So here, of course, the scale is very different from optical sensors. So scattering from longer wavelength microwave sensors is driven by the by larger scale structures. So here, the total amount of biomass, as well as the size, shape, and orientations of the leaves, the stems, and the fruit um, on the canopy. And as well, the scattering will be affected by the total volume in the canopy, but at the molecular level. So why is, uh, why is SAR sensitive to crop type and crop development? Um, that's quite simply because the structure of the crop changes significantly from one crop type to the next. And even as one particular crop type grows, um, its structure changes as it moves through the growing season. So on the right-hand side, I have um, just some schematics of three different crop types. So we have a soybean crop, we have wheat, and we have corn. We know that the total biomass on these different canopies would be quite a bit different, um, but we also note that the structure of these crops are different. Um, so we notice that, for example, um, the soybean plant is, has a much more random structure to it, and the wheat and the corn plant have a more vertical structure. Um, but as well, the individual components are quite different. Um, so in the case of wheat, for example, we have smaller, um, longer uh, leaves, which are somewhat similar to corn, but quite a bit smaller than corn. Um, and the soybean leaves have a completely different shape um, and are certainly much smaller than the leaves on this corn plant. And it's those different structures in those different crops um, that the radar um, microwaves are sensing. Uh, so it's not just the amount of energy that is scattered from a canopy, but radars tell us a lot more about the canopy in terms of the kind of scattering that is that is happening from a crop canopy. So as a microwave signal hits a target, um, the wave will undergo one, two, or many scattering events. Um, and you see that in these pictures on the right-hand side. So if we have a bare soil surface, it has very little structure to it, it's likely that that microwave will, will hit that surface and um, create just one single bounce back to the radar. If we have a target like this corn plant that has some very dominant vertical structures, um, it may be that we will get um, the microwave um, hitting the, uh, the canopy and there being two bounces. So this would be a, um, a double bounce situation. Um, or on the far right, this is a canola field with a lot of structure in it, a very dense um, canopy. And in this case, uh, it's likely that when that microwave enters that canopy, it will undergo many, many um, uh, uh, scattering events before the signal returns to the radar sensor. Um, so the amount, the number of events um, determines the type of scattering, the intensity, as well as changes in the phase of that incident um, microwave. And the scattering events, both the type of scattering and the mixture of scattering that happens within a canopy is very much dependent upon the structure and the geometry of that target. So when we think about agricultural targets, typically we have a dominant scattering uh, type. Uh, for that target, but quite often we have secondary or tertiary um, scattering events. So although one type of scattering will dominate, we will have a mixture of other types of scattering. So it's really the type of scattering, that dominant scattering, um, the mixture of scattering events, how important those secondary and tertiary scattering events are, any changes in the characteristics of the phase, as well as the total intensity, those pieces of information all gives us all they all give us clues about the type and the condition of the crop. So we've talked about the structure of the soil and the structure of the canopy and let's move on and talk about the final piece which is um, about the effect of water in the target. We know that radars are known to be sensitive to moisture but why is that? So on the right hand side this is a little cartoon of a water molecule 
So water is a dipole, and that means that the oxygen side of that dipole molecule carries a net negative charge, while the side with the two hydrogen atoms um, has a net positive charge. Um, and because of that, when we apply an electric field, and a microwave is an electric field, if we apply that electric field, um, that water molecule uh, will rotate and will align itself to that applied field. Um, so we measure um, the, the ease at which that dipole molecule, the ease at which the water molecule responds to the applied field, we measure that um, with the dielectric constant. The dielectric constant is a complex number um, and it's represented by both a real part um, and a, um, an imaginary part. Uh, typically, the real part is much, much larger than the imaginary part, and, and thus we tend to ignore that conductivity, that imaginary part. And real dielectric, um, the real dielectric ranges from a value of about three uh, for very dry conditions up to um, values approaching 80. Uh, so what happens when we apply this electric field? Um, and we see a little um, animation happening here. So what's going on is that when we apply that electric field um, to a dipole like the water molecule, that water molecule will rotate in response to that applied field and that, wa that rotation will hold the energy of that microwave. Once the microwave passes, that water molecule will relax and it will release the energy that it has stored. And we see that in this animation. So what that means is if we have a lot of water molecules in our target, so if we think about soils, we have a lot of water in our soils, we apply an electric field, a microwave um, um, is incident upon that soil, all of those water molecules rotate, there is a great deal of energy that is stored in that rotation, the microwave passes and the energy is released. So what does that mean for radar? Uh, well, there's a strong positive relationship between the real dielectric constant and backscatter, and as well a strong positive relationship between the dielectric constant and soil moisture. So quite simply, the more water in the target, the more energy stored and released, the higher the backscatter and the brighter the return on the radar image. And that applies to any target, whether it's soil, vegetation, or any other target. And on the right-hand side, this is a RadarSat 1 image um, acquired over an area in Canada. And we see many pivot irrigations in this RadarSat 1 image. We see some very bright pivots, um, some very bright radar responses. Um, and that tells us that uh, those pivots have um, those, those fields with those pivots have higher soil moisture in those, in those soils. Um, penetration depth is also important. So recall we talked about this previously. Um, so the penetration depth into soil, whether it's soils or crops, is defined by both the dielectric but as well the wavelength and the incidence angle. Uh, penetration depth increases with wavelength. So remember we talked about L-band being able to penetrate further than, for example, X-band. Um, and the penetration is also greater when the target, whether it's soils or crops, are drier. And finally, I want to conclude with just um, two additional slides. Um, so I want to introduce some complications that we might run into when we are applying radar to monitor agriculture. Uh, so we always want to check the environmental conditions at the time of the image acquisition. So we never want to use radar if, if it was raining at the exact time of the radar acquisition. We think about radars as being all weather, but that doesn't include imaging during um, rain events because the water droplets um, in the atmosphere will cause scattering. Um, and then some parts of the world, for example, the risk of uh, rain occurring is very diurnally dependent. Um, the second rule we want to always be um, thinking about is that we don't want to use radars to measure soil moisture if the ground is frozen. So remember we talked about the water molecule rotating when the, the field is applied. 
Um, but if we have a frozen condition, water is held in place because it's in that frozen condition. The dielectric constant will drop close to zero because that frozen water molecule can't rotate. Um, and thus, even if there is water in the soil, the radar will view the soil as being very dry. Um, so we don't want to do that. We don't want to be acquiring data um, and trying to uh, estimate soil moisture if the water, if the, the soil is frozen. Um, but that also tells us that radars are able to detect freezing and thawing events. And again, in most temperate, ta in, in most temp temperate regions of the world, that freezing occurs diurnally, um, often overnight. Um, and my final slide here, um, the last thing to think about is whether uh, dew may, ha may have been present um, during early morning acquisitions. Um, so the presence of, of sort of standing water on the leaves uh, will increase the backscatter. So that is a big problem if we're doing biophysical modeling um, because that water on the leaves is creating um, a higher backscatter. Um, so dew is most prominent uh, on crop canopies in temperate regions um, in the early morning hours. Uh, so we've talked about a few things, rain, uh, freeze-thaw events, and dew. So there are some things that we can um, that we can do to try to minimize these environmental effects. So of course, always check the the, uh, the meteorological con conditions, um, but it's also possible to select orbits um, ascending during the evening or descending during the morning in order to minimize um, the presence of these environmental conditions. So that concludes our brief uh, review of theory in applying radar to agricultural targets. And now we will move on to discuss um, how to process some of the radar data for both crop classification and soil moisture retrieval. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. So welcome to section two, that's a SAR processing part. My name is Xian Fengjiao. The following section, I will introduce how to estimate soil moisture from radar side two data and how to process multi-frequency data for use in crop classification. We will use SNAP to process SAR imagery. It is free and open source toolbox. The current version of SNAP is 7.0. You can download it from ESA website. Real-time monitoring of soil moisture in the field level can help farmers significantly increase yields and the quality of crops. Radar imagery has been used for soil moisture mapping. The following slides, I will show you how to extract backscatter from radar set to imagery and estimate soil moisture using backscatter and the integral e equation model, IEM model. Radar set 2 was launched in 2007. The satellite has a C-band SAR sensor with multiple polarization modes, including a fully polymetric mode. Four polarizations and phase information are acquired from this mode. There are series steps we need to take to process SAR imagery. We do collaboration to convert DN value to backscatter. We apply sparkle filter to reduce the noise and the geometric correct the image. Uh, let's go ahead, open, uh, open SNAP software. And open a radar set to find crop image. We click open product. And go to the folder to have the data set to image. Mm -hmm. 
you select the zip file and open it. We do not need to unzip a zip file. Snap can ingest the zip file. So from here, from metadata, we will know the image is a friend quad pole mode acquired on May 12th, 2016. And that's a descending path. That's a coordinate of the image. From what view type, you can see the location of the image. It is from Carmen, Manitoba, Canada. The image has four polarizations. H, 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 V, V, H, and V, V, and also have a face information here. The first thing we do is to apply calibration. To do that, we go to reader, radiometric, select calibrate. We specify the input file here. So that's a read as a two raw product. And down here, give the output file name and the folder to store the output file. For setting parameters, we want to keep all these four polarizations, so we do not need to change anything. When we press run, We have a calibrated image pop up this window. So we can open a RGB wheel for this calibrated image. So we put HH in red channel, HV in green, and VV in blue. So we open that. That's a calibrated read side 2 image. The next step is to apply a filter. So we go to radar, sparkle filtering, select a single product sparkle filter. The input file should be the calibrated image. And down here, the same thing, you set up the output folder and output file name. So processing parameters, click here, that's the list of all different filters you can explore with a SNAP. Gamma map filter is a common use for agriculture applications. We will use that today and SNAP 5. Five by five window size. When we press run, we have filtered the image pop up here. We open a RGB wheel for filtered image. The same as on filtered image, we put HH for red channel, put HV for green, and VV for blue. That's filtered image. We can tile the image side by side. So we go to window, tile horizontally, zoom in a little bit. So you will see the difference between filtered and unfiltered image. Uh, how do you determine the optimal filter and the window size? It totally depend on your application and the size of your target. So I have to mention that the raw image is 10 meters resolution. When you apply five by five filter, the actual resolution going to be 50 meters. The next step is to apply geometric correction on the image. So we go to radar. 
geometric terrain correction. We select range Doppler terrain correction. So here, so we select the spot co-filtered image as the input and the processing parameters. We want to keep all four bands here. So we do not need to change anything from here. And you click here. That's the all digital animation model you can use for that terrain correction. So you also can specify your own DEM here. So today I will use SRTM three second DEM. You also need to specify the resolution of your image. I will put 10 meters resolution and specify your map projection. I will use UTM. That's a 14 zoom here. Okay. So leave the other uh, parameters as default. When you hit run, so we have a we open the RGB wheel for this to uh, recorrect the image here. So we have a kind of rated, sparkle filtered, and a geo corrected radar set to image here. So far, I have shown you how to extract backscatter from raw image using SNAP menu function step by step. SNAP also provides graph processing framework, allows you to create batch processing and the customized processing chain. So we can go to Tools, Graph Builder, to build our own graph. So we right click here, add collaboration. You click and drag the operators here, and right click here, add Sparkle filter operator. The next operator would be terrain correction. Drag and click and drag here. You right click here, you will see connect graph. The operator will automatically connect together. The same as we use the menu functions to process the image. We need to set up the process parameters for each operator. In the right type, we have to specify the raw image as the input. For calibration type, we want to keep all four, four polarizations here. The buckle filter type, we want to select the filter we're going to be used and give the window size here. To correction, we want to select the DM we use and specify the image resolution and the image projection. Okay, so that's a right operator. It specifies output folder and output file name. You hit run, the graph builder will automatically process the data. You also can save the graph for future batch processing.
So now I have show you how to extract backscatcher from RISA site to raw product. We will use RISA backscatcher model, IEM model, to estimate soil moisture from backscatcher imagery. IEM model is a physical model. No any pure information is needed. We only need RISA backscatcher imagery and the fractions of soil clay and sandy information. For original IEM model, the RISA backscatcher is present as a function of soil dielectric constant, room mean square height, and roughness correlation length. To solve this three unknown, we need to we need at least three measures of backscatcher. So if you have two images acquired at different incident angle, which HH and VV polarizations, you can use original IM model to map soil moisture. Baghdadi proposed a collaborated IM model, introduce the optimal roughness correlation length, which can be estimated from, from RMS height and the SAG configurations like uh, incidence angle, polarization, and the radar wavelength. So calibrated IEM model reduce the number of unknown to two and require only two backscatter measurements. If you have one image acquired with HH and VV polarization, or you have two images acquired at different incident angle, which HH or VV polarizations, you can use calibrated IEM model to retrieve soil moisture. Soil Moisture Toolbox was a snap plug-in for version 6. For some reason, the current version snap does not include this toolbox. Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada is in discussion with the company, try to make it include into snap again. If you want to have this toolbox, you can send me an email or send the email to Heather McNary. We will send you a soil moisture to toolbox installation file. So so if you have a soil moisture toolbox installed, when you click reader, you will see soil moisture menu here. You can produce a soil moisture map step by step. Pre-process the image to extract the backscatter first. Apply the IEM or calibrated IEM model and then inverse the model to retrieve soil moisture. You also can use end-to-end -end graph to batch process the soil moisture map. Today, I will use end-to-end -end graph show you how to process soil moisture map with the IEM hybrid invasion method. That's a hybrid invasion method. That's the graph for this method. It requires two images which HH and VV polarizations for input. I have two radar side two quad power image. Let's open that. This image is a ascending mode acquired in the evening. So we can open an RGB wheel for this. We can use a poly file for RGB image. Let's open that. And this one is a descending image acquired in the morning. 
So we open the RGB wheel again, use a pony profile. So we tile the image side by side. You will see the two images acquired with a different geometric. The two images were acquired 12 hours apart. So we see in this processing graph, we need a specified reader for one, for example, for ascending image for reader one. And uh, for category type, we need to select HH and VV polarization. So we do not need HV and VH. And the nice sparkle filter. We won't use a box car 5x5 in this case. During correction, we use a three second SRTM DM model and leave the other parameters as default. We do the same thing for the second image. So here, we specify the second image as the input. And for calibration type, we select HH and VV. Sparkle filter. So we keep box car field five by five window size. Period correction, we leave all those parameters as default. Once we have a backscatter extract from the image, we need to create a stack to combine two images into one file. So here we quick step to so leave all parameters as default. The nice operator will be IEM hybrid invention. So that's a lookup table we want to use to estimate soil dielectric content from backscatter image. You do not need to change anything, just leave all those parameters as default. So IEM model was developed over bare soil to convert dielectric constants to soil moisture content, we need a land cover map to identify bare soil area and the soil texture map to specify the fraction of clay and sand. So in this type, you will specify which land cover map we're going to use and give the soil moisture type soil moisture map to specify the fraction of clay and sand. The next step, we use Hanley Canyon model to convert soil dielectric constant to volumetric soil moisture. And the next step, for the final product of soil moisture map, we want to show soil moisture on the bare soil. So you can select all the land cover types 
want to show the soil moisture from here, from that type, that land cover mask type. The last one, the right type. The basified output file and output folder. So when you hit run, the graph builder will automatically process the soil moisture map. So that process will take a long time. I already have a soil moisture map. I will roll that in. So you will see the soil moisture map is generated on the overlap geographic area of these two input images. The next uh, the, the following slides, I will show you how to prepare the reader set image, how to prepare the imagery for in use for crop classification. Crop classification is another important agriculture application for radar imagery. As we all know that star waves can penetrate into crop canopy. The longer the wavelength, the greater the penetration into the target. For crop classification, shorter wavelengths is preferred because this provides the best opportunity for multiple scattering within the canopy. X-band sensor, like Terrasar X imagery, provides very good classification results. Many studies also demonstrate that multiple frequency approach provides excellent crop classification results. In 2016, we collect three Risa Z2 quad pole image, two Terrasa X, and three Sentinel 1 images over common study set. We will use this multiple frequency star imagery to perform crop classification. I have showed how to extract backscatter from Resaset 2 data. The following slides, I will show you how to extract backscatter from Terrasa X and Sentinel 1 data. Terrasa X was launched in 2007, has X band sensor. Drip map mode provides 3 meters resolution for single pole image and 6 meters resolution for dual pole data. Let's open one Terrasa image with a snap. From Manta data, you will see that the strip map mode, the image was acquired on August 16, 2000. 16 and has a VH VV polarization descending path. So here we see the location of the image. We can open the RGB wheel for this raw image. So we use the VH for red channel VV for green and VH for red again. That's the raw Terrasa X strip map due for image. The same as process with set to data. We need a calibrated image first, convert DN value to backscatter, apply sparkle filter to reduce noisy and the geometric correct image. So we can build a graph to batch processing the image. So we go to tools, build graph. The same as we process the data set to image. 
the first we need a calibrate operator here. And the next we add the buckle filter. And then the next the terrain correction. So we connect the operators together and specify process parameters for each operator. So read would be the raw Terza image, calibrate. So we want the intensity image only. So we select VH and VV intensity. Sparkle filter to select what the filter you want to apply to the image and give the and give the filter windows to recorrection. So we still want to use a three second SRTM DM and we specify the image resolution as five meters. Use the UTM projection. That's a for zone 14. Okay. So if you hit run, you will have a collaborated, filtered, and to re-corrected Parasite X backscatter. I already processed this image. I can open one for you. The open the RGB wheel for this image. We use the HV for red, VV for green, and the HV for blue channel again. So that's processed Terza X dual image. Sentinel-1 has two satellites. Sentinel-1A was launched in 2014, and Sentinel-1B launched in 2016. Interferometric wide swath is default mode over land. You can access the data through Vertex Data Portal. You need to define the geographic regions you want to search and give the start and end days for search. The portal will pop up all available images for you to download. Let's open one raw Sentinel one image. So we look at the metadata. We know that the interferometry wide swath, that's IW mode, image was acquired on July 7th, 2016. And it's a ascending mode, has a VH and VV polarization. So we can open the RGB wheel for that raw image. We put VH for red channel, VV for blue, VV for green, and VH for blue again. So we click open that. Here are the steps to process Sentinel-1 SAR GRDH data with a SNAP. The only difference with the Redasite 2 and the Terza X data is to apply the orbit file first. During the acquisition, the satellite position is recorded by the 
Global Navigation Satellite System to assure fast delivery of Sentinel-1 products, orbit information generated by GNSS, are stored with the Sentinel-1 Level 1 product. The orbit positions are later refined. If you want to use process orbit file to geometric correct your image, you have to download it first. You can go to ESA website to download it. Snap also has a function to automatically download it for you. Let's build a graph to extract the backscatter from Sentinel-1 data. So we go to Tools, Build Graph. So for Sentinel-1 data, the first thing we need to add orbit file, apply orbit file here. And then we need to calibrate the image. And apply the sparkle filter. The next step would be geometric correct the image. Then connect all operators. So for red type, we select the raw Sentinel-1 image here. We apply orbit file. So we want to use the process Sentinel-1 orbit file. We leave default here. Collaboration type, we want to keep all this two polarization. The bug filter, we need to select which filters want to apply to the image and give the window size here. Career correction, the same as the radar side 2 and Terra X data, you need to specify the DM you want to use and give the image resolution and image projection. So, right tab, define the output folder and output file name. When you hit run, you will have backscatter extracted from Sentinel-1 data. So I already have this process before, so I just load it up with it. We can open the RGB wheel. Put HV in red channel, VV in green, and HV in red again. You see that's calibrated, filtered, and the geometric corrected Sentinel-1 backscatter image. So now we have backscatter images extracted from Redaside 2. Terra X and the Sentinel 1 data. Let me load each of these backscatter images to snap. That load one data set to image. Open the RGB wheel. We use the Pony profile for RGB wheel. And then we open the Terra X image. 
open the RGB wheel, H V V V and H V again. The other one we open the Sentinel one backscatter image. We can tile the image side by side. So you from here you will see the image have a different footprint. Data set two data has fifty kilometers swath wide, and Terrasar strip map dual image has fifteen kilometers swath. Wide. Sentinel 1 has 250 kilometers swath wide. We will perform classification on the overlap areas of this image. To reduce the data volume, we subset Reza Site 2 and the Sentinel 1 image to the area of Terra X footprint. So to do so, we go to we go to raster subset. There are three types here. This one for defined the cropped area. This one. Defined for selecting the bands to be cropped, and this one for select the metadata to be added. In the first type, we're going to use geo coordinate, the latitude, give the latitude and longitude to crop the image. So here we give a 39.5. Nine and minus point two point two thirty nine three five eight. So you see this window, that's your call the window. So for band subset type, we will keep all these four bands and the maintain data we leave all this as default. When we click OK, we will subset data set to image to the area of Teresa X. So I have I have all three data set two. Subset image here, we can open the one for RGB image. That's one data set to subset image. And we have a two Terra X image. We opened one use the RGB wheel. That's all Terra X backscatter. And I also have a three subset image for Sentinel one. So we can open one for Sentinel one. Use H V in red, V V green, and H V in blue again. So we tile the image. So you will see the three three type of 
backscatter image we are going to use for crop classification. That image. The next step, we need to co-register all subset image to align all image and create a step. Put all images, backscatter images, to one file. To do that, we go to go to reader co-registration. Click co registration. There are several tabs here. The first tab asks you to input all your image. So we click this button. This will add all your opened image to that tab. And the next one, we leave the create stack. We leave we select bilinear interpolate and use orbit information here. So this we leave all these parameters as default. So we give the right give the output folder an output name. So if you hit run the So if you hit run, you will have a, a stacked image. So I already have the image, so I can load it to the snap. That's one. We will see bands. So that's a stacked image. Have all pairs are backscatter here, and all three data set two backscatter, and three sentinel one backscatter here. Once we have an image stack, we are ready to start to perform classification at this point you can export data into the software you choose. Whatever you want to use, you can use the R, Python, or other software to manipulate your data. Snap is really great to export file into different format. So you go to File, Export. There is a whole list of all formats you can use. So today we will export a GeoTIFF image. So for use in corp classification. So that's all I I showed the for part two. Uh, pre-process the image for crop classification. I will pass this to Sarah. She will show you how to perform crop classification using process backscatter imagery. Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Banks, and I'm a physical scientist at Environment and Climate Change Canada. I'm going to be presenting on land cover classification using random forests. So in this webinar, we've gone over the theory, and Nina has shown you how to extract analysis-ready products using the SNAP environment. Now we're going to go into more of the practical applications, how we can use this data to identify crop types. To do this, we're going to do a land cover classification using the inputs that uh, Nina has shown you how to generate. And we can also select the best variables based on the theory that Heather has provided. In this tutorial, we will provide you with a basic understanding of random forests. 
This classification method has proven effective for a number of different applications, including crop type identification. We will start with a brief description of classification and regression trees, or CART, which is the basis for random forests. We will list some of the advantages of random forests. We will also describe in detail how random forest works and what the required inputs and parameters are. Finally, we will demonstrate how to implement random forests using RStudio, an open source statistical computing environment. Classification and regression trees, or CART, work by partitioning or splitting a data set using binary tests. CART models can be easily interpreted as a tree of such tests and their outcome. The purpose of these tests is to make groups that are as homogeneous as possible. Here, for example, we show a simple model for classifying three species, mouse, cat, and dog. If we run the three data points on the left-hand side down the tree, we can see that the model works well for these three cases. Notably, this model contains only categorical data, but CART works well for combining both conti continuous and categorical data sets, as it makes no assumptions about the distribution of your data. Now we will define some important terms that we refer to in the subsequent slides. Here we have a data set that contains three different species, mouse, cat, and dog. We have multiple predictor variables that can be used for classification. Consider whether the animal is afraid of dogs. There is only one cat that isn't afraid of dogs, but otherwise all cats and mice are afraid of dogs. So this variable would be good for separating cats and mice from dogs. Notice again that this is a categorical variable, but we also have length and height, which are continuous. We can combine both of these in our model. From this data set, we have generated a single classification and regression tree. What we call the leaf nodes represents the final class prediction. These are shown using green rectangles. Each data point that is classified will end up at one of these leaves. The path each data point takes, however, varies depending on the binary tests that make up the model, as well as its values for those variables. The tree expands outwards from the root node, where we apply the first test. Before this test is applied, all the data points are unclassified. At each, each subsequent internal non-leaf node, there is another binary test that determines the path toward the leaf. The branches on the tree represent the outcome of each test. We call these the left and right branches. For example, at the root node, the binary test is whether the animal squeaks. If yes, the data point is sent down the left branch. If no, the data point is sent down the right branch, where additional tests using other predictor variables are applied until a leaf node is reached. Random forest is an extension of the CART method, which was popularized by Leo Bremen and Adele Cutler in 2001. It is an ensemble learning method, whereby a single model made up of multiple classification and regression trees make a collective prediction based on a majority vote mechanism. The idea behind this is to prevent overfitting. Overfitting occurs when a model works well for your data set, but cannot be applied more generally. This is something that often happens with single classification and regression trees and requires pruning to reduce the complexity of your model. Also, accuracies can be increased through a majority vote of diverse trees. Random forest is a computationally efficient method and it is easy to implement parallel processing as each tree is constructed independently. It is also easy to implement as there are few parameters and little tuning required compared to other methods. Let's look at the differences between CART and random forest. For CART, a single classification and regression tree is generated, whereas for random forest, hundreds or thousands of trees are generated. In CART, pruning is required to avoid overfitting to apply the model more generally. Random forest avoids overfitting because of the high number and diversity among trees. This is achieved by random sampling applied both to training data and predictor variables used for node splitting. 
For random forests, generally only a subset of all variables are tested to determine the optimal split at each node. For CART, all variables are tested at each node. For random forests, only about two thirds of all data points provided for model training are used in the construction of each tree. For CART, all data points are used. For CART, there is no internal validation procedure requ requiring an independent assessment to determine model accuracy. With random forest, the proportion of data points not used to construct a given tree can be used to evaluate its accuracy. This process is repeated across all trees to evaluate the model's overall accuracy. There are some additional relevant terms that are specific to random forest that we must go over before we can describe how it works. Note that we'll explain each of these in more detail in later slides. N-tree defines the number of trees contained in each model. We refer to these models as a forest because they contain multiple trees. The probability is the number of trees that vote with the majority divided by the total number of trees in the forest. Values range from zero to one and can give you an idea of the confidence with which you can interpret the results. Higher values indicate more trees voted for the same class, therefore you can be more confident that the correct label has been assigned. This value is calculated for each pixel in your image and can vary depending on the separability of your classes or the quality of the data used for classification. mTRI is the number of variables tested to determine the optimal split at each node. This is usually a number less than the total number of predictor variables. In the R code that we'll go over later, the default value is the square root of the total number of variables contained in your data set. The out-of-bag accuracy is random forest internal accuracy assessment. It is calculated based on the proportion of a given data set not used during the construction of a given tree. This is approximately a third of all your data points. The mean decrease in accuracy quantifies variable importance by measuring the change in accuracy after the value of a given predictor variable is randomly permuted. This takes away its predictive power. Before we can describe how random forest works, we also need to understand the genie impurity. This is how node splitting is automated and optimized. The genie impurity is the probability of classifying a data point incorrectly. If we randomly pick a point in a data set, and randomly label it according to the distribution of classes for that data set, what is the probability that this is incorrect? In this example, we have a coin purse containing an equal number of pennies and quarters. We have another coin purse containing an equal number of labels for quarters and pennies. If we randomly pick from the first purse, there is a 50% chance that we choose a quarter. What is the probability then that we also pick the incorrect label from the second purse? There is a 50% chance that we choose the penny label. So deter to determine the probability of incorrectly labeling a quarter, we have to multiply both probabilities. That's 50% multiplied by 50%, which equals 25%, giving us a 25% chance of classifying quarters incorrectly. But we also need to know that the what the probability is of classifying pennies incorrectly. Again, there's a 50% chance that we choose a penny from the first purse and a 50% chance that we choose a quarter label from the second purse. So to determine the probability of classifying pennies incorrectly, we have to multiply both probabilities. That's 50% multiplied by 50%, which equals 25%. This gives us a 25% chance of classifying pennies incorrectly. We want to know the probability of misclassifying either pennies or quarters, so we have to sum those two probabilities. 25% plus 25% is equal to 50%. The genie impurity of this data set is the probability of classifying any coin incorrectly, which is 50% or 0.5. It's worth noting that the probability of classifying quarters and pennies correctly is also 50%. Now, what if the two classes are not equally distributed? In this example, we have eight quarters and two pennies. So what is the probability of randomly selecting a quarter from the first purse? It's 
What is the probability then that we choose a penny label from the second purse? It's low, it's 20% because there are fewer penny labels. So the probability of classifying quarters incorrectly is 80% times 20%, which equals 16%. Similarly, the probability of choosing a penny from the first purse is low, 20%. But the probability of choosing a quarter label is high, it's 80%. So the probability of classifying pennies incorrectly is 20% multiplied by 80%, which equals 16%. Again, the total probability of classifying both quarters and pennies incorrectly is the sum of these two probabilities. 16% plus 16% equals 32%. The Gini impurity of this data set is the probability of classifying any coins incorrectly, which is 32% or 0.32. Note that the probability of classifying quarters correctly is high, 64%, while the probability of classifying pennies correctly is low, 4%. So how can the Gini impurity be used for splitting? In this example, we have two variables and two classes, green triangles and blue circles. Based on the previous slides, we know the Gini impurity of the whole data set is 0.5. This is because we have an equal number of blue circles and green triangles. We don't know where the perfect split is, but we can test all possible splits to find out. We determine the quality of the split by weighting the Gini impurity of the resulting nodes by the number of data points in them. Let's try our first split around 1.5 for variable one. Again, the Gini impurity of the whole data set is 0.5. We can then calculate the Gini impurity for both the right and left nodes. The Gini impurity of the right node is zero. This means that the probability of classifying any of these blue circles incorrectly is zero. That's because this node only contains blue circles. There is a 100% chance that you will choose a blue circle and a 100% chance you will choose a blue circle label. This is the best possible value you can achieve for the Gini impurity since it represents a so-called pure node. This means that all the samples in that node are from the same class. The Gini impurity of the left node is 0.28, which means there is a 28% chance of classifying any of the circles and triangles incorrectly. We can now calculate the, G, Gini, the weighted Gini impurity of both the right and left nodes. The right node contains 40% of the total number of data points, so we multiply this by the Gini impurity of that node. We do the same for the left node, which contains 60% of the total number of data points. The new weighted impurity of the data set based on this split is 0.17 or 17%. If we take the Gini impurity of the original data set, 50%, and take away the Gini impurity of the data set now, 17%, we can see that we have removed 33% of the impurity of the original data set using this split. This difference is what we call the Gini gain. The higher this value is, the better the split. In this second example, we will try another split. If we follow the same procedure, we can see with, that with this split, the Gini impurity of the right node is 0.44 and the left node is 0.38. The weighted impurity is 0.42. Therefore, you can see that with this split, we have removed much less impurity from the original data set, only 0.08 or 8%. We can therefore say that the first split we tried is better. Now let's get into how random forest works. To construct a random forest model requ requires a training data set. This is labeled classes with associated predictor, predictor variables containing a value for each data point. Each row is a single data point for training the model. Each column contains the value of a given predictor variable. In this example, we want to create a model to identify the species type. This data set consists of three species, mouse, cat, and dog. There are multiple predictor variables we can use to train the model. Note that this data set contains categorical data, like whether the animal barks, 
and continuous data like height and length. Random forests can handle both in combination. The first step in random forest is to create a training data set to grow the first tree. To do this, for n number of data points, we randomly sample n cases with replacement. You will note that this does result in replicates. However, this is partly how we get multiple diverse trees. This is how we prevent overfitting. When many samples are chosen this way, on average, this results in approximately two thirds of all data points being selected for training a single tree. Thus, approximately one third are also left out. These can be used to evaluate the accuracy of the newly constructed tree. After building this training data set, the next step is to select a subset of predictor variables to determine the optimal one for splitting at the first node and subsequent nodes. This training data set consists of nine variables. We will select only three to determine the optimal one used for splitting. This is the square root of the total number of predictor variables. This is the default setting in the R code that we're going to go over shortly. So the first variable we randomly select is squeak. In the middle of the slide, you can see the results of splitting on this variable. The squeak variable only contains two values, yes or no. Therefore, there is only one possible split point that can be evaluated. This variable is good for separating mouse from cat and dog, since only the mice squeak. We can see that the Gini gain from this split is 0.32. This is pretty high because we're creating one pure node of just mice. The second predictor variable that we randomly select is meows. This variable is good for separating cat from mouse and dog since only cats meow. However, you'll notice that one cat does not meow. Therefore, while we have one pure node containing just cats, there is one cat in the node containing all the mice and dogs. Therefore, the Gini gain from this split is slightly less than the squeak variable. The third predictor variable that we randomly select is height. This is a continuous variable. So unlike squeak and meows, there are more splits points in the data set. Random Forest will evaluate all splits in this data set to determine which is optimal. The Gini gain from all splits have, that have been evaluated are shown in the table. We can see that the squeak variable gave the highest Gini gain and so will be the one used for splitting the first node. This results in eight mice going down the left node. This is a terminal leaf node. All the cats and dogs go to the right node. We now only consider these data points which need to be split further. We begin the variable selection process again. This time we randomly select the likes cheese variable. Note that only one cat does not like cheese. So this split does not remove much impurity from the original data set, as we would still have seven cats and 11 dogs in the same node. Therefore, the Gini gain from this split is low, 0.04. The second variable that we randomly select is barks. This variable removes more impurity, though there are some dogs that don't bark, so cannot be separated from cats.
The third variable that we randomly select is collar. All cats and dogs but one in this data set wear a collar. So this variable also does not remove much impurity from the data set. Why is the Gini gain for a collar less than the likes cheese variable? This is as a result of the difference in the number of samples in each class. In this case, there are 10 dogs and eight cats. The Barks variable provides the highest Gini gain, so it's used for splitting. In this case, eight dogs go to the left node, a terminal leaf, leaf node. This is a pure node again, because it only consists of dogs. Now we have to separate the remaining three dogs and eight, catch, eight cats, which were sent to the right node. To speed things up, let's say that the optimal split after checking three randomly selected variables was found using the afraid of dogs variable. Again, in this case, there is only one possible split as the data set contains only two variables. We can now fully separate cats and dogs because none of the dogs are afraid of dogs. Therefore, eight cats are sent to the left node and three dogs are sent to the right node. All the nodes at this point are terminal leaves. They are also pure nodes with no confusion among the species. Note that this is only one tree. This process is repeated usually hundreds to thousands of times with different training samples each time. The final classification for all data points is determined by taking the mode or majority prediction of all trees in the forest. This is also referred to as a majority voting process. In this example, we can see that for the first tree, this cat is incorrectly classified as a dog. Now we run this same data point down another tree, which is completely different from the first. With this tree, the cat has been correctly classified. At this point then, we have one vote for dog and one vote for cat. We run this same data, data point down a third tree. And again, it is correctly classified as cat. We repeat this for all trees. In this case, we have nine trees. So we have nine votes in total. Since in this case, the majority vote is for cat, the final prediction is cat. We calculate the probability of this as two thirds or 67%. And in this case, the number of trees in our forest is equal to nine. Now we want to know how accurate our model is. To do this, we use the sample from our original data set that was not selected during random sampling with replacement. Again, this is approximately one third of the total data set. We take the three mice samples and run them down the tree. As you can see, all of them have been accurately classified using the squeak variable. The four cat samples are run down the tree. Three are correctly classified, but one is incorrectly labeled as dog. This is because unlike the other cats, this one's not afraid of dogs. So our model is imperfect it cannot correctly classify this cat, which may be a cougar. The three dog samples are run down the tree. None of them squeak, but all of them bark. So all of them have been correctly classified by this model. We can consider all these samples together to give us the out of bag error, which for this single tree is 10%. However, we want to get an idea of how the model as a whole is performing. To do this, we calculate the out of bag error matrix. Here you can see for three different trees that were generated with different training data, each time consisting of two thirds of all available data points. This also means that the out of bag sample differs between each tree. 
The final out-of-bag error is also based on a majority voting process. Here we show an example of a single model composed of nine trees. We will see for one data point how the out-of-bag error is calculated. For the first tree, this data point was included in the out-of-bag sample. Therefore, it is run down the tree. In this case, it is accurately classified as mouse. That gives us one vote for mouse. In the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth tree, this data point was not included in the out-of-bag sample because it was included in the training sample. So it is not used to evaluate these models. For the seventh tree, this data point was included in the out-of-bag sample. So it's run down that tree. In this case, it is accurately classified as mouse, giving us a second vote for mouse. For the eighth tree, again, this data point was included in the out-of-bag sample, so it's run down that tree. It is accurately classified as mouse, giving us a third vote for mouse. For the ninth tree, this data point was not included in the out-of-bag sample. This process is repeated for all data points. In this case, we show you the result, results for mouse. You can see that for the nine data points, eight had a majority vote for mouse and one had a majority vote for cat. These values are added to the out of bag confusion matrix and the total error can be calculated. In this case, for mouse, the out of bag error is 10%. It's important to note that this process is repeated usually for hundreds or thousands of trees. We can also get an understanding of the importance of each variable to the model by calculating the mean decrease in accuracy, which ranks variables by the relative importance. In this example, we have one model for which we have calculated the out-of-bag accuracy. Note that this is different than the error rate. If we want to calculate the mean decrease in accuracy for the length variable, we randomly permute its values. This means the values of the out-of-bag samples are randomly shuffled. This removes the predictive power of that variable for that tree. We then run all the out-of-bag samples down the tree and you can see that this permutation of the length variable has resulted in many misclassifications. There are now two dogs and one cat in the first terminal leaf node, which would all be labeled as mouse. After permuting the length variable, the out-of-bag accuracy is 40%. This means that in this case, the length variable was very important for achieving high accuracies. The difference in accuracy is 50%. This process is repeated for all trees in the forest, and the mean decrease in accuracy is calculated as the average decrease in accuracy for all trees, normalized by the standard deviation. For this hands-on demonstration, we will show you how to run random forests using RStudio. I will say that we're gonna go over this hands-on demonstration pretty quickly you are not expected to follow along as we go through it. So the recording will be available afterwards, so you can look at it and go at your own pace. As a first step, you should install the latest version of R and RStudio. Second, open RStudio. Below you can see the RStudio interface, which we will not go over in detail as there are many resources online to learn how to use RStudio. Now you have to install four libraries. This includes Raster, Random Forest, Spatial, or SP, and RGDAL. You can find more information about each of these in the R documentation files. To do this, simply type the text you see here into the command line for each library. Then, Load each library by typing the text you see here into the command line. Again, this must be completed for each library. 
Now we will open an existing script that we will use for the remainder of the hands-on demonstration. To run each line, we simply highlight the text below each step and hit the run button in the top right hand corner of the script window. Now we will set our working directory. This allows you to avoid typing full path names. This should be where your raster data, training and validation data are located and is also where the results will be saved. Now we read and create a raster object by typing the text you see here into the command line. You should reference the image you want to use to construct your random forest model, and in this case is also the image that will be classified. In this example, we are reading in a multi-channel TIFF file containing both the TERSRX, RARESET2, and Sentinel data that was processed previously. Then, read in your training and validation data set. In this case, we have manually separated two-thirds of our data points for training and left a third for independent validation. It may not be necessary to do an independent validation and instead rely just on the out-of-bag accuracy assessment. However, as we will show, sometimes these results differ. This can be due to issues like those related to the effects of spatial autocorrelation in your data set. So it's always good to run both and compare them. Here we use CSV files containing just three columns of information. The latitude and longitude of each training point, as well as an associated class label. Note that in this case, we will be classifying crop types, including barley, spring wheat, soybeans, and corn. Now we must identify which columns contain the coordinate information. To do, to do this, we use the coordinate function of the spatial or SP library. We manually assign the projection of the training points using the projection for string command, which is also part of the spatial or SP library. Now we extract the training data. This is the value of each raster band coincident with all the training points distributed throughout the scene. These are our predictor variables. At this stage, we select which predictor variables to use in the model. Our image has 22 bands, so we will include all of them for the purpose of this demonstration. Now we will create our random forest model. Note here that the predictor data is the value of the predictor variables at each point. The Y variable is our so-called training response. These are the class labels. Ntree defines the number of trees that are generated from, for this model. The other parameters define the following. If we do not provide a value for mtry, which is the case here, it will use the default setting, which is equal to the square root of the total number of predictor variables in the original data set. Heap.forest is set to true because we want to use this model to predict the class at each pixel in the image. Importance is set to true so we can evaluate the importance of each predictor variable. We also have a parameter to remove no data values. Now we print the out of bag confusion matrix using the rtree function. Here we can see that the overall error rate is 17% and the per class error rates range from 4 to 27%. Using the importance function, we can now look at variable importance ranking. We can see that band 11 has the highest mean decrease in accuracy. This is the VH polarization of the rare set 2 image acquired on July 27, 2016. We can now repeat the same process that we applied for extracting the training data to do an independent validation. Here you can see that both the validation data sets represented by green triangles and the training data set represented by red X's are located in different areas on the map. 
This is because we want to get an idea of how well the model does throughout the rest of the scene as we will apply this to each pixel. Now we classify the independent validation data using the model we just created. We can also generate a confusion matrix using the independent validation data. From this, we can calculate our overall accuracy, per class accuracies, and the Kappa statistic. The overall accuracy in this case is 82%. This means that the error rate was 18%. If we compare that to the out of bag error rate, which was 27%, there is a difference. This can be a result of multiple factors. In this case, this is probably because we used relatively few training and validation samples for each class. Finally, we can classify the whole raster. This shows the predicted spatial extent of each crop type throughout the entire scene. At this point, you can start to think about how to improve your model by including more training data or different predictor variables, as an example. Here we have included a few references if you're interested in more information about random forests. And we would like to thank all of those that contributed to this material. I just wanted to thank everyone that was able to join in for the webinar. We went over some theory. We showed you how to extract analysis ready products from radar data. And we also showed a practical applications, which was land cover classification using random forest. And I hope that your takeaway is that Radar is useful for a variety of agricultural applications, including crop type identification and soil moisture modeling. And now I'll pass the mic back to Erica so we can go to our question and answer period. Thank you very much for that great webinar. There is a homework and you'll uh, see the link on the RCEP webpage. And now we will open up our session to the Q&A period, so please go ahead and type in your questions in the box. All right, so uh, let's start with the questions that are on the Google Doc. And what we've done is we've taken the questions you've typed in, we've put them on the Google Doc. These will be available too, we'll be posting these. So we've got the team from uh, Canada, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and Environment Canada online, and they will be answering your questions. So uh, uh, please go ahead, uh, Dr. McNairn. Um, okay, so we'll start at the top at question uh, one, um, and we'll answer these questions as best uh, as best as possible. Um, so the first question is, what is the uh, best polarization for rice crop classification? Um, so what we have found in our research is that um, regardless of crop type, uh, the cross polarization, which is HV or VH, uh, is the single best classif classifier uh, for all crop types. So that would be the one that we would recommend. Uh, this, uh, I, I guess I would add to that that uh, if if uh, you were to select a second uh, favorite polarization for crop classification, that would be uh, VB. And so for Agriculture Canada, we have an operational activity that uses SAR data for crop classification, and those are the two polarizations that we use, VH and VB. Um, question number two uh, is, what is a single tillage operation? Um, so I guess I probably mentioned that during my presentation. Um, what we mean by a single tillage operation, um, this is perhaps more specific to agriculture in Canada, and, and what it means is that typically farmers will uh, till their fields um, multiple times between the time that they harvest the, the crop and when they plant the next crop. So they may till the, uh, the soil once, they may till it twice and they may even till it three times. Um, so it can be quite a complex um, tillage system. So what I mean by single tillage operation, 
that would be using a one single tillage implement and tilling um, the field once. Uh, question number three, do optical images give better results than microwave images? Um, so that's a complicated question to answer because um, it, it really matters in terms of uh, what the application is that you're most interested in um, and what kind of data you have available. Um, I'll use a simple example in terms of crop classification because that's what we were talking about today. Um, in, that, in that particular example, if we have uh, a very good temporal coverage of optical data, um, so optical data through the entire growing season capturing you know, all of the different crop development stages, optical data can do a very good job of crop classification. Um, but of course, the problem we have is with, with cloud cover. Um, and so if we miss some optical images, during the growing season that can really significantly reduce our classification accuracy. Um, and we've done some recent comparisons um, at Agriculture Canada looking at um, available optical data in a growing season and compared it to classification accuracies um, using a, a good temporal coverage of radar data and we're finding um, pretty comparable results between the two. Um, on the other hand, we also talked about soil moisture today, um, and uh, undoubtedly to estimate soil moisture um, from satellite data, microwaves, um, and, and SAR data are by far the best. That's because of their sensitivity to soil moisture um, and as well their penetration depth. Um, so this is a bit of a complicated uh, question because uh, it really depends on the application and it depends on um, sort of the, the sequence of data that you have for that application. Um, okay, question four, what, uh, when you're using free data sets, which is typically Sentinel or JAXA data, how would you adjust your analysis? Um, so uh, I think Nina went through um, uh, the Sentinel data for sure. Um, and the processing is really not that much different whether the data set is free or, um, or it's, it's, it's available in another way. Um, so the, the access to the data really doesn't have a big impact in terms of how the data is processed. Uh, question number five. Um, how does a higher number of scattering impact the quality of information obtainable from a SAR image? Um, so again, this is a bit of a tough question, but um, uh, we really rely on uh, large variations in types of scattering in order to separate targets. So if you think about crop classification, for example, um, if we have a lot of diversity in terms of the type of scattering that's happening between one crop type and another, um, so we have more different types of scattering, um, this can really help us separate not only one crop from another, but help us monitor the crop development over time. So scattering from crops um, is, is really a mixture. Um, so we usually have a diversity of different types of scattering coming from agricultural targets and that mixture of scattering changes depending on the crop type and the crop growth stage. Um, so that you know, increase in diversity and scattering um, really helps us in separating out those targets. Um, okay, so the next question, number six, uh, says integration of data from different our satellites in detecting detection of agriculture crops is advantageous. Advantageous. What about crop disease and crop damage? So I'll address this in two ways. Um, in terms of sort of directly um, estimating uh, the impact of crop, the impact or presence of crop disease or crop damage. Um, if that disease or that damage is causing, um, in particular, a change in the structure of the crop, um, then um, I, would, I would hypothesize that SAR data would be quite sensitive to that. 
I'll give you a very good example. Um, so if you have an infestation of insects in a field, for example, um, and they eat a lot of the leaves off of the crop, that really changes the structure of the crop. So in Canada, for example, I've seen grasshoppers invade wheat fields and strip the leaves off of the wheat crop. And because that fundamentally changes the structure of that canopy, now we have very few leaves on the canopy that would be um, most likely detectable using um, SAR data. Um, so I would hypothesize that if there's a change in the structure, uh, SAR data would likely be able to detect that damage. Um, but of course, when we're thinking about disease and um, we're thinking about crop damage, we want to catch this early on. Um, and so one thing to consider is not just measuring directly disease or damage, but trying to use SAR data to estimate some of the conditions that would lead to the development of disease, for example. So we had a project looking at uh, taking soil moisture estimated from radar data and trying to um, track um, the wetness in the soil using radar data because that extreme wetness can cause um, or create the right conditions for disease to occur. So you can also use radar data in that capacity. As well, cropping history is often important. So you can use radar data, for example, to mon monitor um, crop type over time and um, detect what kind of rotations are occurring because that can also be uh, a factor in terms of um, the development of crop disease. So there's a direct detection component that I talked about, but also using some of the data from, um, from SAR data to track the conditions that would lead uh, to this type of crop disease. Um, I think Erica is still typing. Uh, how would you measure vertical height? Um, I'm not sure that I... Uh, Okay, I'm not sure I, I entirely understand what you mean by vertical height, but I'll, I'll, I'll take a guess at that. Um, if you're talking about um, like the root mean square um, roughness uh, or correlation length in terms of uh, roughness on soils, um, it can be done a few ways. Um, typically, we put some sort of instrument in the field, like a gridded panel, or we have a, something that's called a pin board. And uh, then we take photographs of how the surface displaces um, against these, this gridded board or how the roughness displaces the pins. Um, and then we take those photographs and we do some post-processing um, to sort of fit a, um, a vertical um, or sort of fit a, uh, a horizontal plane through that, uh, those photographs and then calculate the root mean square roughness. Um, so those are sort of the low-tech ways of doing it, using a gridded board or a pin board, um, or some uh, researchers uh, have access to a laser profiler, um, and that would provide um, uh, data as well in terms of the surface height variation. And you know, you can contact us later, and we can send you more information on how these, uh, what these instruments are, and how they're used. Um, Okay, so the next question, question eight, um, says, can I say that SAR remote sensing techniques need a lot of field-based calibration and validation than all other remote sensing techniques, e.g. Uh, photogrammetry, data, spectrometry, data, et cetera? Um, I don't think that um, field calibration validation is unique to SAR data. Um, I'll use an example. We have some methods that uh, we're developing to estimate biomass from SAR data. So that requires, um, to create those models, we need um, data in terms of biomass and soil moisture in the field, and we need to validate those models that are developed. But if I was using an optical sensor, I need the same type of field data to create a model um, and to validate the model as well. So I think that's, a, uh, that's sort of a standard principle in remote sensing. 
um, and I'm not sure that it's unique to, to SAR. And in terms of the SAR instruments themselves, um, you know, the data providers are doing a lot of calibration of those sensors, but that's true of the optical sensors as well. So um, especially if you're deriving biophysical estimates, from radar optical data, um, I think the calibration validation requirements um, are quite similar. Okay, so then question nine is, would backscatter be affected by contaminated water such as brackish or industrial wastewater? Um, I don't know about the industrial wastewater. Um, we did have uh, a discussion recently about whether SAR data uh, is able to, or SAR data is sensitive to, for example, salinity in soils. Um, and there has been some research to demonstrate that there is um, some sensitivity there, especially at higher salt content, because um, uh, because uh, it affects the imaginary part of that dielectric. Um, in terms of uh, standing water, so if we have, um, you know, standing brackish water, for example, um, I would hypothesize that that wouldn't be um, something that the SAR would be um, would be sensitive to, because in that situation, the SAR is mo most sensitive to uh, to the structure. So it's really develop it's really um, responding to um, the smoothness or the roughness in the water. So if you think about ocean applications, for example, we either have this specular reflection from oceans or we have um, diffuse scattering because of, of um, surface um, ocean features. Um, so it's more related to the structure in these open water and ocean um, environments than it is to um, sort of the, the physical qualities of the water. Okay, so question 10 uh, is a little bit related to that. It, it, it says that um, the more water in the target, the higher the backscattering and the brighter the image from the radar, whether vegetation or soil type. But on slide 17 on the first presentation, the rivers and reservoirs show up as very dark. Why is this? So that's a really good question, a little bit related to what I just said. Um, when we think about targets, um, whether it's vegetation or soil, the parameter that has the, the, by far the greatest impact on the radar response is the structure. Um, so if we talk about water here, for example, as I was just saying, um, smooth water um, that doesn't have um, sort of surface waves um, is very smooth and that causes specular reflection. And then if we have water that, uh, like I said, op open ocean where we have waves, waves occurring, that roughness on the surface structure um, is by far the most important um, factor that affects the radar response. We need to have water in the target in order for there um, to be a response, um, but the, the overwhelming uh, target parameter that has the biggest impact on radar backscatter is structure. So think about that in terms of soils, surface water, um, or vegetation. And I think question 11 is, 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 is the same one. So because we had two questions, that's something that in future we will um, make sure that that's clear. Um, how can we differentiate different types of crop fields in small farmland? Is it possible to do the above mentioned SAR? Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, the techniques that we were talking about, the theory as well as how to classify and how to um, extract uh, soil moisture. All of those techniques and methods can be applied um, to different scales. Um, so it's it's really less of a of a question in terms of of, of the scale. So the data that Nina and uh, Sarah were showing um, are from uh, satellites like Sentinel and RadarSat, for example. Um, and the data that we were using, the resolutions were um, perhaps a little bit too coarse for these smaller um, farming um, 
uh, cropping systems. But the theory is the same, the physics is the same, the methods would work um, if you can access data at the uh, spatial resolution that's appropriate for your, um, your cropping system. Okay, question 13. Can we use the one-year temporal baseline to calculate the annual subsidence rate using Sentinel-1A SLC? Um, so I think this is a question um, perhaps more related to INSAR applications. Um, that's not something that I'm uh, much of an expert in. Um, but there has been um, a lot of work at looking at Sentinel-1 data for INSAR applications. And in fact, we just delivered a five-day training workshop um, at a university here in Canada, and we, um, we provided background on INSAR theory, and then uh, we used SNAP to, um, to create um, uh, INSAR uh, um, uh, some INSAR um, uh, products using um, Sentinel-1 data and SNAP. Um, so we can certainly share uh, that training material with you so you can um, understand how to use SNAP data and apply that to INSAR with Sentinel-1 data. Um, I'm not sure what the next question is. What is the pixel in square area of each interferogram? Because that wasn't part of our. Um, yeah, we didn't cover that in the uh, the presentation. But again, we have this training material on INSAR data processing of Sentinel One and SNAP, and we can share that with you, and that might um, answer that question. Do we have miniature SAR sensors, for example, to be carried by UAV? Um, the short answer is yes. Um, I have not used any of those myself, but I have had conversations with others um, where we see this development occurring. Um, so I can't comment specifically on how that technology is working, um, but I do know that there are research groups that um, have been looking into developing and fitting UAVs with SAR. Um, so probably a, a literature search, or if you can't find anything that way, you could contact me, and, and I might be able to put you in contact with some of those research groups. Okay. Um, crop picks technology are calculating ESVI, and they claim that it is similar to NDVI. Is it possible using Sentinel-1, and what is the formula for it? you know what ESVI is? I'm not sure what, what they mean by ESVI. It's maybe something that I'm not familiar with. But I will comment that actually Nina and I are working on um, uh, trying to develop a, um, a radar index for crop condition. And we're trying to intercalibrate that with NDVI. Um, so although NDVI, which comes from optical data and radar indices, <clears throat> excuse me, radar indices that are being derived from radar data. Um, they're following the crop development in a very similar way. We see the curves um, are often quite similar. Um, NDVI is obviously responding to, um, um, to sort of the biochemical changes in crops as they develop and SARS responding to the physical changes in the structure of the crop. Um, so, you know, physically they're responding to different things, but they follow very similar patterns. And indeed, we're trying to intercalibrate optical and radar indices ourselves. Um, so I think that there's um, a lot of potential there. Um, okay. The next question, can we obtain a link to the radar set 2 data set used in the demo by Jinseng so we can play around with the data? Um, so, uh, the, the difficulty we have with RadarSat2 data is that uh, that data is commercially available, um, and so uh, we can't distribute the data without permission from both the Canadian Space Agency and MDA. 
Um, and so it wouldn't be possible for us to, to share that particular data set. Um, if you're interested in some of the value added products um, that we've derived from Radar Set 2, we could, we could perhaps share those. Um, so at the moment, the best data to work with would be um, Sentinel-1 data um, or going through uh, DLR to get access to um, some uh, research data from Terrasar app. Apart from soil moisture applications, can we use SAR to identify contamination of the soil? Um, and that I, I don't know, I don't have an answer for that. Um, I myself am not familiar with um, any applications or any researchers that, that have been have been doing that, um, but you'd have again you have to think about what radar is responding to structure and moisture um, and if it's sort of a biochemical um, change in the soil then I would suggest probably optical data would be the best data for that purpose. Um, the next question, I'll try to answer that, and then Jin Feng can um, jump in if uh, she wants to add to this. Um, is the soil moisture graphic builder and SNAP suitable for tropical climate? Um, I don't think that it's specific to any particular geography, and um, so that that graph builder and the soil moisture retrieval um, could be applied um, really anywhere. Um, as Jin Feng said, however, um, keep in mind that the IEM model and CBAN radar data in particular um, is not able to estimate soil moisture under a large canopies um, and dense canopies. So we've been focusing more on applying that retrieval um, under uh, under bare soil conditions. Um, if you are working in a developing country, would, where would you obtain the clay sand fraction map and how detailed does the soil land cover map need to be? Um, I, I don't have an answer in terms of in your particular country where you would get access to uh, the clay sand fraction. Um, I think FAO has um, global data sets of uh, soil type. And um, available soils data are problematic everywhere. Um, so even in Canada, we don't have um, as detailed soils data as we would like to have. Um, so we're using the best available data um, that we can access. Um, so that is sort of a, a problem, I think, that is globally recognized is that our data sets are um, maybe not as, 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 um, as detailed as we would like it to be. There's also an initiative, um, I'm not involved in that, but I, I know about it, um, where a consortium of researchers around the world are um, producing 250 meter gridded soils data. And if you contact me, I can, I can put you in contact with um, my colleague here at Agriculture Canada, who is um, part of that initiative. So again, there's the FAO uh, soil, global soil cover, and as well this 250 meter gridded soils data. Um, these methods for soil moisture retriever are only possible with quad pole imagery, correct? Is it possible for Sentinel-1? In this case, can you say something about the openness of Radar Set 2 data and its pricing if it's not freely available? Um, so starting with the last part, as I was just mentioning, um, no, Radar Set 2 data is only available commercially. Um, and, uh, but for example, um, Canada's new RCM data, that has an open data policy. Um, and as I mentioned, Sentinel-1 as well um, is uh, something to consider. Uh, you're correct that some of the soil moisture retrievals require not necessarily quad pool data, but they require HH polarized data and VV polarized data. So Radar Set 2 does not have a dual-like polarization mode on it. So we can't program Radar Set 2 for just HH and VV. And that's why we're collecting quad pole data so that we can simulate the HH and VV backscatter. 
Um, so Sentinel-1 as well does not have an HH and VV um, backscatter mode. Um, so in the stone moisture retrieval with the IM, the, the only option you have right now for Sentinel-1 data is to use um, the uh, dual incidence angle um, approach. So in that approach, you uh, would be using a VV image from one Sentinel-1 acquisition and um, a second VV polarization from a second um, Sentinel-1 acquisition. And that means you want to minimize the time between those two acquisitions so that the soil moisture is not changing. We sometimes use AM and PM or ascending and descending orbits which give us about a 12-hour time difference to do this multi-angle retrieval. Um, if we think ahead, however, um, I mentioned the Raider Set Constellation. It does have a dual um, HHVV polarization mode on it, and we specifically asked for that for this reason. Um, and it also has a compact polarimetric mode, and we've been doing research to um, uh, to sort of adapt the IM model to use compact pole data. Um, so that are, those are a couple of ways to get around that limitation. Um, uh, what, okay, so Erica just typed, what if, okay, now open. Oh, Raider, yes, so Raider set one data is, is now um, currently available, so that's actually another good option. Again, it's only HH polarization, but you could combine like an ascending and descending HH Raider Set 2 image to do the multi incidence angle retrieval. So that's another good option. Um, okay, how would I, okay. Um, would I have to know the soil content for the region? I'm applying the um, graphical soil moisture retrieval before I use it. Um, so using the IM model with uh, SAR data um, retrieves the dielectric constant, the real dielectric constant. Um, what we need the, the soil clay and sand fractions for is to convert that real dielectric constant to um, true volumetric soil moisture. Um, so if you don't have any information about the soils, you can still retrieve the dielectric. Um, it is, of course, very related and correlated with soil moisture. Um, so you can still use the dielectric constant as an indicator of sort of the state of, of water in, in the soil. Um, but you would need um, some way to convert the dielectric to um, soil moisture, and we do that through um, uh, both the clay and sand fraction. Uh, okay, so the next question is, um, how, can, uh, how can you compare SNAP versus PCI Geomatica for radar processing? I'm aware of the advantage of free software, but what if we have access to both? Will we have access to the radar set two image used in the webinar? So I think I covered the issues about sharing the radar set two data. Um, we can't share the raw data. Um, if there's some process product that you're interested in, we could share that. Um, we chose SNAP because it's free and open, um, and Sarah was presenting on R because it's um, free and open as well. Um, we ourselves use PCI Geomatica as well, um, so we use actually a, a range of different software. We use SNAP, we use PCI Geomatica, we use C5, and, um, and a few other pieces of software as well. Um, so they all have their advantages and disadvantages, and PCI is, is, um, is obviously a great tool for uh, processing SAR data. Um, at the moment, it doesn't have the IEM retrieval for, um, for soil moisture in PCI, but um, it's certainly a very good piece of software to do all of the other radar processing. Okay, is there a way we can get the sample data sets for crop classification? Um, uh, certainly, the Sentinel data we can share, and we can share some of the training data as well, um, if there's interest in that. 
Um, the Terrasar X data, we would have to get permission from the German Space Agency to share that with you. Um, uh, so we would have to go through that process. But the other data, um, the Sentinel and, and, and field data, we could share that with you. Okay, um, I think the next question is the same. Is it possible to access all the data uh, used to produce the soil moisture map, including the radio set image, the snap graph? Um, so I think, uh, as I was saying, I think everything um, besides the raw RadioSat2 data we could share with you, so um, that won't be a problem. Uh, question 27, can Sentinel-1 SAR data be used for crop classification? I think we answered that in a previous question. Uh, question 28, I don't have field data. Is there any way to retrieve this information if you know the major crops and growing season? Uh, that's, um, that would be pretty, pretty difficult to achieve. Um, as I mentioned, it, at Agriculture Canada, we have an operational crop inventory. Um, our operational group produces a map of every crop growing in every field across Canada every year. Um, but we need field data to feed the classifier, um, regardless of whether it's an unsupervised or a supervised classification, you need knowledge about what's on the field. Um, having said that, um, there are other ways to collect field data. Um, you can certainly go in the field and make observations. Um, here in Canada, we also access crop insurance data. Um, in the U.S., um, there is the cropland data layer that is that is produced by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, and there may be other uh, ways and, and data sets that, that you could have access to if you don't have access to um, you know, direct observations in the field. Um, so think about some of those broader options. Others have also talked about crowdsourcing, um, so getting data from um, just the general community in terms of observations in the field. But to do any classification, you'll need some knowledge um, of what's in the field to do the classification and to do the validation as well. Okay, so the next question is, in the soil moisture map, in which units are the values of each pixel? Um, so the final soil moisture maps are volumetric uh, soil moisture, and so the unit that we're displaying them in is um, cubic meters by cubic meters. It's sort of a standard. Um, you could display it in other ways, um, cubic centimeters by cubic centimeters, or as a percentage as well. Uh, do you have a script that can do soil moisture estimation in Google Earth Engine? Oh, Nina's shaking her head, so that means no, we don't. Um, so we're doing all of our processing on local computers and banks of servers. Um, and so doing this type of um, web processing is the way of the future, um, but uh, at the moment we're not, um, we're not involved in that, although we are looking at um, that as an option going forward. Okay, can you provide some details regarding the validation, um, the validation that was done to test the soil moisture process you showed in SNAP? That's a very good question. Um, so uh, in Canada, we have three networks of in-situ stations. Um, I think there are about 25 stations in total. And uh, those stations have been um, operating since 2011. And these stations measure um, volumetric soil moisture at the surface and down to the rooting zone um, using Stevens Hydro probes. And measurements are taken every uh, 15 minutes. Um, and then we, we uh, send that data every hour um, to our headquarters here in Ottawa. We apply calibration equations and quality check flags. Um, and so we are doing a continuous validation of all of the radar sat data products that are being produced over these in-situ stations. So we compare the measurements in the field at the exact time that the satellite's coming over with what um, the retrievals um, are using the IM. Uh, in the metadata of, for example, Sentinel-1 data, is there a glossary which indicates what the abbreviations used mean? Uh, 
Yeah, I think if you uh, Google search the Sentinel One data product description, you will find the PDF file. So that in that file, there's all the uh, de details about uh, Sentinel One information, all process levels, all um, kind of reasons applied for different products there. So if you download that file, you need you know all the that terms. Um, so I um, I have to leave um, the the meeting uh, at this moment because I have another meeting that I need to go to. Um, I think Nina and um, and Sarah are going to stay on the line and and continue to answer the questions um, related to um, to the processing of the data. And if there are other questions that we weren't able to get at, um, I'd be happy to to answer those if you uh, provide uh, an email for me. Thank you very much, Dr. McNair. And so let's continue then uh, going down uh, the questions. And I'll let uh, yeah, Nina or Sarah uh, go through the rest of them. Okay, so the next question, hopefully you can all hear me now is uh, as I can see it, it is unsupervised classification. Is there a way to do supervised classification with ground test data in SNAP using SAR data? Uh, we don't actually use SNAP a lot for classification, but I believe there is a way to run random forests in SNAP environment. But one thing that you should keep in mind is that there's a bit less flexibility if you wanna work in the SNAP environment compared to something like R or Python. So it's possible, but you're going to have a bit less flexibility. And I'll, I'll let you answer the next question, Nina. Yeah, the next question, what type of calibration image is better for soil moisture analysis, sigma nodes or gamma nodes, and then why? So we use sigma nodes because all methodologies are um, Build on sigma nodes. So there's a sigma node and gamma node that is a different with a geometric, uh, that's a triangle geometric. Uh, that's why. So we use a sigma node. Okay, the next question is uh, for random forests, what's the maximum target uh, species we can put into random forests? Uh, there's no limitation because of how. Uh, the method actually works. How the code was implemented in R, I believe there is a limit of 30 classes. Uh, something around 30. I'm not 100% sure, but I believe there is a limit just because of how it was implemented in R. Uh, number question 36. How can we download the random forest R script used in the tutorial? Uh, you, we would be willing to share the code that we showed you guys. Uh, if you could contact us, we would definitely share that code with you. Question 37, was each pixel in crop classification example labeled or each field was labeled? In other words, what was predicted, a pixel label or a field? Some aggregated aggregation of pixels label. Uh, in this case, we just did a pixel-wise classification, but definitely you can do object-based classification with random forests. You just have to modify your data or code uh, depending on how you do it, but it's definitely possible to do an object-based classification and uh, would probably be the pre preferred method for agriculture, agriculture since everything is the same class within that field object. Question 38, how would you plot the data as a time series and what value would it provide? Uh, you can look at a multiple different uh, SAR-derived uh, values and plot them as a time series. Uh, this could show you different things like changes in phenology and changes in crop density, which would differ depending on the crop type or the crop condition. 
Uh, that's something that you could definitely get from SAR data, looking at changes in the temporal information, changes in backscatter, for example. And uh, something that I'll just uh, make a note of for everyone is that what's great about SAR data is that you don't have to worry about the effects of cloud cover or haze on your acquisition. So you have this capacity to do high frequency temporal time series analyses, whereas with optical data, if there's haze or cloud cover, you don't get that, uh, that acquisition or you don't get much useful information um, about the crop type on the ground. And Okay, 39, is it possible today's webinar can be completed in Google Earth Engine rather than using Snap or R? All of them are free software, but it would be nice to do it in Google Earth Engine in order to, to save time and space. Yes, it's definitely possible to do everything that we did in Google Earth Engine, but it's important to remember that the RadarSat 2 data is not available in Google Earth Engine. Um, the RadarSat Constellation, which was recently launched, will also not be available in Google Earth Engine, but you do have access to all the Sentinel archive and all the Landsat data. And yes, it is possible to run random forests in Google Earth Engine. So uh, number 40 is data, is SAR data useful for classification of vegetation and forest? Uh, I think this really depends on how similar the backscatter is between the two different land cover types. Over a forest, you usually see a large proportion of what we call volume scattering. And that is basically just a random scattering process. Um, so it's possible that you could see this similar scattering process over certain crop types uh, that have a similar randomly oriented leaves and branches, but uh, it's really case dependent, but it may be possible. Question 41, can we differentiate tree species and model their growth by using SAR? If yes, what is the best model to use? Uh, I'll start this question, the answer off by saying I'm not a specialist, but uh, something that's kind of interesting that we've observed is that you can sometimes tell the difference between coniferous and deciduous species by looking at the difference in temporal backscatter. So for the leafing out of the canopy, we do see a change over time in the backscatter, and we don't see that similar response for uh, deciduous uh, species. So that's kind of an interesting thing, but uh, down to the very specific species level, uh, I'm not really sure I'm not a specialist. So 42, as random forest classification is demonstrated here, it is the best classifier for agriculture. What about the accuracy exhibited by other supervised or unsupervised algorithms for classification. Uh, you know, how you choose your classification algorithm really depends on the data that you have available and what your objectives are. We showed you random forest because it has a lot of advantages. It's really easy to implement and there's not a lot of tuning that's required in order to uh, get a final model and achieve high accuracies. So there's not a lot of things that you need to adjust. And in this case, you don't often need a high number of training and validation samples to get high accuracies. With something like deep learning, you, you're, it's necessary to do a lot of tuning to really uh, make your model work and to get high accuracies. But in the long run, this may be something that you are willing to do also, you need a lot of training and validation data to do that. So it really depends on what you have at your disposal, uh, how much time you want to invest in uh, creating your model and tuning it. So it's really dependent, but uh, certainly you can achieve higher accuracies with other classification methods.
Okay, and uh, Nina, maybe you can answer question 43. I cannot see 43 right now. 43, how do we mix optical and side data for core classification? Do you have an example combine optical and radar points with the same classification? Yeah, we do um, have this uh, experiment. So optical, typically optical provide the best results, but sometimes it's hard to get the uh, optical acquisition at the critical uh, growing uh, time period. So if you combine optical and the star data, we will provide the better results. Yeah, I think we uh, had to have a presentation, have a slide to show the optical, combine optical and the SAR data together, get a better result. But it really depends on your um, corp type. Some corp type optical uh, image does a good job. Some corp type is really work with SAR data. Okay, so I think um, with that, we'll conclude because we've run out of time. So just wanted to, uh, first of all, thank our guest speakers from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and Environment Canada, Dr. Heather McNairn, uh, uh, Nina, Sarah, and Amir. And I'd also like to thank the RSET team, Brock Blevins, Elizabeth Hook, Sean McCartney, Selwyn hudson Odoi. David Barbado, Amita Mehta, and Anna Prados. And of course, thank you to all of you for tuning in, for your interest, for all your questions. We'll be posting all of this online, the presentations, the Q&A, and the recordings. Also, please don't forget there, there is a homework and you'll uh, see the link here, uh, as well as on the RCEP webpage. So if you have any specific questions, any additional specific questions, please feel free to email either uh, uh, um, Dr. McNair and her team or email me if it's related to uh, the flooding, the first part of this webinar series. So um, uh, please keep tuned. We will have other SAR webinars in the near future. So hope to see you then and wishing you all a great day. <laughs>